Good evening and welcome to Martin's Drinks Club. And welcome to the very first of Martin's Drinks Club. I'm Paul Smith from Word Gets Around and I'm your host for this evening. Martin and I are very excited that you are able to join us this evening. Now this has been in the pipeline for a little while since the first uh, lockdown. So very excited that you're able to join us tonight. A chance for Martin to teach you how to make some wonderful drinks at home to enjoy in these as the cold winter months come up. So great that you're able to join us. First of all, uh, a little bit about Martin. So what can I tell you? So Martin uh, achieved his first professional drinks qualification in 1973 and has continued to keep pace with industry developments ever since. He's been a professional wine and spirit educator since 1988, past Southwest Chapman of the UK Bartenders Guild and is passionate about all things drinks, including of course, craft beers and ciders. He's now a resident in Taunton and keen to share his knowledge with local enthusiasts. So that's you. So a uh, huge thanks, first of all, uh, to Lizzie James and Joe Middleton, who both kindly contributed towards the kit that Martin is using tonight. Also, thank you to Martin uh, for his contributions to our magazine, Word Gets Around Magazine in Taunton, where Martin writes a regular column about cocktails, and all food and drink on a local level. So thank you to Martin for that. Please feel free to comment as we go on and hopefully uh, we have some time at the end for Martin to answer some of your questions. Maybe you'd like to share your favorite tipple that you enjoy at the moment. Maybe there's a cocktail that you've never been able to quite crack and that you maybe have got a question about that. So please pop that in the comment section as well. Finally, uh, next week, uh, after this uh, first event, we are looking for contributions uh, for this, for people that are taking part towards Taunton Food Bank. So donations towards local people. So if you enjoy the show, if you'd like to, to take part and maybe make some contributions to that, further details will be announced at a later date. Another important thing to do, so make sure you hit that like button. If you're enjoying this, share it with your friends, tell them you're online, and maybe you've got a drink in hand uh, just like me. So Martin, hopefully Martin is raring to go. Is he there? Let's have a look. Hopefully he is. There he is. Good evening, Martin. What have you got on there? Well, this is a mask. It's got a cocktail on it. But we don't need that tonight because we're at home. And that's the great thing is this evening, it's going to be fun. Um, over the years, I've run many courses. I've delivered at uh, gin festivals and lots of other shows. And it's been much more serious. Tonight is all about helping you have much more fun at home with your drinks. So without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do this evening. It's really the basics this evening. So. Well, Martin, okay. before we start, before we start, I'm going to hand it over to you. OK, on with the show. <laughs> OK, my apologies. Right, folks, this is all a learning curve for, for all of us, I think, uh, like so many things in life at the moment. So what are we going to do this evening? Well, first of all, the basics. I'm going to tell you what is a cocktail, because there's a lot of confusion about this. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we started um, on the road from basically a pink gin, which was much used by the Royal Navy um, in the officers' mess. The ratings tended to drink rum, but the officers would drink pink gin. Pink gin had obviously the gin in it and Angostura bitters. The Angostura bitters make the gin pink, but it was perceived to have many medical qualities. So that's where we really start uh, at the beginning of the 18th century or thereabouts. 
And then, of course, we move on to gin and tonic. Gin and tonic is what would be termed in the trade as a mixed drink. And this is very important because if you're in a bar or a pub or a hotel and you ask for a spirit, it has to be in the prescribed measure. I'm going to come on to this in a second. But you can't just serve any measure. The measures are laid down by law. So they are served in government stamp measures, which look something like this. This is what we call a jigger. And in the bar, this will be, have a government stamp on it. So one side would be 25 millimeters or a double would be 50. Now that's the case in England. If you're watching in Scotland or Ireland, they have 30 and 60. So it's not even across the UK the same measure, but it is a prescribed bum measure. Now, once you have three liquids in a drink, which can include ice, can include lemon juice, could include all sorts of things. If there are three liquids in the drink, it becomes a cocktail, at which stage every ingredient is no longer measured. So it's quite interesting to know that fact. So that's basically how we get to the cocktail. Now, I've talked already about some of the aspects. I'm going to talk about and this is in very basic terms because we can go into this in much more detail as the weeks and hopefully the months go on. But first of all, the three ways of mixing your drink. The most simple way is to take a glass. This is uh, an old fashioned glass or a rocks glass. You put ice in it and then you pour whatever spirits and other mixers and other ingredients are going in the drink. You may give it a quick stir or you may just not bother, you may just drink it. Um, if you're drinking whiskey over ice on the rocks, as the Americans would say, that is all you have to do. There's no other method of mixing it. It's all done in the glass. But for many drinks and particularly cocktails where we have these different ingredients, we really want to mix it uh, thoroughly first to get a harmonious um, balance between the various ingredients. So this is what's called a mixing glass. Now at home, you don't have to have a mixing glass. We're going to talk about cocktail shakers in a moment. This is known as a Boston shaker. And you'll notice this is two halves. The same way that you can mix in the mixing glass, you could, if you wish, just use the other part of your shaker. You don't have to buy a mixing glass if you don't want. I like to use a mixing glass because it's got a lip and it's easier to pour. So that's the mixing glass. And then we have shakers. Now, the most common form of shakers that's used in bars around the world is the Boston shaker. But we didn't start there. In the 30s, that would have been a much more typical shaker, particularly in domestic homes. Now, I've had this shaker probably for nearly 50 years, but I don't use it. I don't use it because it's smaller than the other shaker. It's in three parts. That part comes off very easily. But my problem is I can't get the top off. And that is very important because I can't wash it properly, so it's not very hygienic. The other thing is when you use a shaker like this and it's chilled down very heavily with ice and you shake it up and then you try and take it apart, you'll find that it's changed with the very cold temperature. And I've seen barmen in tears in competition because they can't get the cocktail shaker apart. So that's why we tend to use the Boston shaker. If you really want to get snazzy, that's a two piece shaker, which I love to use. It's a lovely feel to it, and it chills the drink down very quickly because it's stainless steel on the outside and the inside rather, brass on the inside. It's a nice shaker to use, but when you're starting off, you just get one of these. And as I'll show you later, you shake it up, you give it a tap, and it breaks the vacuum and it comes apart. So it's very easy to use, and that's what we want in the early stages. So we talked about how we shape. Just for the record, if you wanted to buy a simple kit, I'll mention it at this early stage. 
you can get one of these, a Boston shaker, a measure, a strainer, Hawthorne shaker, a strainer rather, all for about £20. And I'll give you some hints and tips um, at the end of each week where you can buy um, all the various things I'm talking about if you want to. Um, I'm not getting commission or any incentive from anybody. These are completely objective um, comments from my point of view, which might help you. But by all means, look on the internet and see if you can find it somewhere else, if you so wish. So that's um, the basic measure. Now, I've shown you this. The problem with this, that's 25 milliliters. Now, let's say the cocktail that you're making demands five milliliters of an ingredient. Now, a barman who's been doing this for many years in the bar will know by eye. He'll look in. In fact, in many parts of the world, they don't use these at all. They do everything by eye. But we tend to measure things out. And certainly it's a good discipline to get into a home because we don't want waste and we don't want a cocktails out of balance because we use far too much of one rather than the other. So for many years, I've used one of these. I don't know whether you can see this. I'll try and hold it closer to the camera. It's a little Pyrex measure. It's very good because you've got gradations in there. I doubt you can actually see this, but you can get these in Lakeland and many other shops. It's got um, everything from five milliliters right up to 60 mil. Um, so it's very clear to read, except for the fact that you'll notice because of the shape for the very small measures, you're looking right down the bottom of this measure to find the five millimeter. So this came on the market really just a few weeks ago. This is produced by a firm called Difford's. Now Simon Difford is renowned as one of the great cocktail gurus in the world. He's not a barman. What Simon Differt does, he writes, and he has uh, been writing for many years a cocktail guide, which used to come out annually, but um, these days the interval's a bit longer, but that's the Difford's Guide. And I recommend this, I don't know whether you can all see it. The Difford's Guide has 3,000 cocktails. The beauty of this book, great Christmas present for 28 pounds. This book, not only has it, has it just been reissued, it's completely up to date, but it's got lots of pictures in it and it's a wonderful book as a reference. If you hear about a particular cocktail, you'll almost certainly find it in there. And to go with it, there's a website. So I strongly recommend that. These are, you can get them online. They're uh, just under eight pounds. And I find these are marvelous because, because of the shape, you can see so much more clearly the smaller measures. And whilst we're on the subject of books, I'll just get this out of the way. The other book that I strongly recommend is called The Joy of Mixology. I don't know whether you can all see that. You can buy this through Amazon. This was um, a new edition that came out in 2018. And the author, Gary Reagan, um, who is really revered by cocktail bartenders around the world, he died at a very uh, young age, really. I, mean, I don't think he was uh, much more than 60, but. Um, he has written uh, so much about cocktails and it's so sad that he died. Um, but there we go, uh, that, that these things happen. But I strongly recommend Simon Differ's book, very different, but the way it's constructed, it makes it very easy to understand how different cocktails fit together. So that's the measures of the books. The last thing about, um, yes, the last thing I just want to mention about bar tools are strainers. Now, you'll hear Barman talk about a Hawthorne shaker. That's a Hawthorne shaker. You'll notice there's a spring around it. And the beauty of this is it will fit any of your bits of kit. So you can use it in a mixing glass, and you'll see me use it later. Or if you, you're using one of these, a Boston shaker, again, fits in there just the same and it will hold back the ice, most importantly, but it, what it will not do is hold back all the little flecks of ice and little bits of lemon, and if you're using mint and so on, it tends to make the drink cloudy. 
we'll talk more when we talk about shakers as opposed to um, mixing classes. But that is a fine shaker. Now you'll find in some recipes you do both. What you do is you stir in here or you shake in the shaker and then if you pour through the fine strainer, the fine strainer will take all those little flecks of ice out which will make your drink cloudy. And when we make a martini, I will talk about shaken not stirred because according to the purists, that's completely wrong. You should always stir not shake a martini. And Ian Fleming, who wrote the original James Bond books, knew that. He was a great cocktail man. And um, we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in three weeks time when I talk about that particular drink. So glasses. There are only two main types of glass, but you'll find so many more variants today. And these are for classic cocktails. You get specialist glasses for specialist cocktails, but really there's something very much for the future. So the two main glasses, classical shapes, that is what we call a rocks glass. And that particular glass um, certainly would go back to the 1930s. It came out of my mother's cocktail cabinet. I still love drinking out of these glasses. And the other glass that you will use a lot of the time is this glass. This is a martini glass, also known as the cocktail glass, and there are variants. Now, basically, that's all you need, just those two glasses, except for certain drinks. That beautiful glass I bought on um, eBay, that's got Venetian glass at the base, the top is a classic martini shape and it's just very nice to drink out of or you might find a glass like that another type of martini glass which i love um, narrower and taller and finally the coupe which was very fashionable for champagne in the 30s and over the years we've moved to flutes for champagne but still very good for many cocktails and whenever you can use a martini glass you can use the coupe as an alternative. And finally, just two variants. This is a tall glass which um, you would use for certain drinks, for certain long drinks. It's nicer to have the tall shape. Um, it's also usually got a slightly greater volume in it, um, but that's um, a very important glass. And then these days, for lots of cocktails, you have lots of ice or, or spheres of ice and a lot of ice in the drink well my little rocks glass that i've got there by the time you filled it with ice you can't get the cocktail in so that i bought in Taunton from hatchers it's a dartington crystal glass and i bought a pair of those for i think about 16 pounds not horrendously expensive but i find it extremely useful but really if you only want two glasses the martini glass and the ordinary rocks glass. Well, that's the glasses. I just want to mention one thing about the book again, because we will be referring to this as the weeks go on. What makes this book different is Gary Reagan, when he published the first edition about 20 years ago, categorized cocktails into styles of cocktail, which makes it very easy to, um, to vary what you're trying to do. So, um, there, for example, there'll be a section just called Sours. And then you'll find there are lots of variants just by changing one spirit. So it helps you to understand the fit. And nobody else, in my view, has done that so successfully. And it applies to all drinks across the board, all cocktails, without regard to any specific type of spirit. So that's the books. Now, I'm going to go on to a very brief introduction to spirit before I talk about the cocktail of the week. Now, what is a spirit? Well, let's go back a stage and talk about fermentation. You all know about fermentation. It's taking a fermentable product, which has either got sugar or starch or something in it, which is fermentable. Sometimes it happens all by itself. A grape for making wine will start to ferment before you do anything with it. We have instances where elephants eat fruit that's on the ground 
and get blind drunk and they're quite dangerous in that condition because it's all started without the intervention of man. So that's fermenting and from that we get our beers, our ciders, our wine. These are all fermented drinks. Then about the 8th century, there was um, a Muslim, um, what we would have said in those days and more, who discovered the process of distillation. And that is taking your fermented product, putting it through a still, so that what you're doing is you're driving off all the vapors which you're collecting, and you get a much stronger drink. Perfumes are made by this method, and so are spirits. It wasn't so much for drinking, it was more in those days as um, for medicines. Because they found that a lot of fermented products uh, were the basis for, for curing all sorts of things. And indeed, from there, we found that most of the fermented and the uh, distilled drinks were made by monks. Quite strange to think about it today, but the church was heavily involved in this as well. So anyway, that's fermentation going on to distillation. And over the years, we've had many, many different spirits or distilled products that have evolved. So what am I going to do this evening? Well, I'm going to do a martini this week. And before I do that, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm saving that for a later week. But I just want to talk very, very briefly about gin. Gin didn't start in this country. That is from Bols in Holland. And Bols was established in 1575. And that was the origin of gin. And gin came over to this country during the time of William of Orange. He came over with his wife, Mary. Mary was the daughter of James uh, II of England. And um, she loved her gin. And that was when gin was brought over to England and um, became incredibly popular. The reason it became so popular, we were at war with the French. So smuggling was rife because the only way you could get brandy because it was against the law to import it was the smugglers who used to bring it in very much in this part of the world in Devon and Cornwall. Uh, but uh, basically it was illegal. So gin was the first drink. I won't go into the whole history of gin now, as I said before, that's just a snapshot. But one of the very, very early drinks from a gin was Tanqueray. Now, prior to Tanqueray, there's another company you'd know very well called Gordon's. Now, Gordon's was one of the top eight distillers in terms of size. But the product that Gordon's made in those days wasn't the best. Anchorate were what they call finishers. You used to buy gin from the uh, big distilleries, the big eight, and then they used to play around with it to make uh, a superior product. And the two companies were very close. So um, at the end of the 19th century, the two companies merged to become Tanqueray Gordon, as they are today. Now, I will not use Gordon's in cocktails. I will not use Smirnoff in cocktails and I I'm not sure about today but for many many years Bacardi fell into the same category and what happened was I remember it distinctly when it happened it was uh, late 70s all three companies reduced the alcoholic strength to 37 and a half percent and this was a huge saving in excise duty but they did not reduce the price of the consumer at a stroke, all the serious bars in London, in the big hotels, they all changed their preferred gin, their preferred vodka, for that very reason. And I've never gone back to these companies because when you're making cocktails, the strength is very important because you're going to dilute them with ice. So, right, I've talked about um, the classic cocktails. Right. I'm going to mention an earlier drink than the one I'm making this evening called the Martinez. Now I will be making the Martinez at a later date, in about um, four weeks time. 
The Martinez came before the Martini. The Martinez was much sweeter. And the Martini was revolutionary because it was a very dry drink by comparison to anything else. And the Martini is basically two things. We went, as I said, from pink gin to gin and tonic to the Martini. And the Martini, uh, you take Gordon's gin, or you take Tanqueray, or you take Beef Eater, but all the classic ones, as I say, I've, I've always loved Tanqueray, very traditional. And you take vermouth called Noi Pra, which is a classic. You could also buy dry martini, but Noi Pra is a particularly good one. And we're going to mix the two. Now, I believe I'll actually have to do this now. Yeah. So basically, what are we going to do first? We're going to chill our glass down. Now, this evening, I will use this particular glass. And what we do, if you're on your own, you can handle the ice. If you will drink. But if you're making a drink for somebody else, you don't touch the ice. It's a hygiene thing. And I get very upset if somebody touches the ice and they put it in the glass. Now, what I normally do um, is I put water in with the ice because that will chill the ice down much more. Um, because of space, I haven't brought the water over this evening. But you make sure that your glass is as cold as it can possibly be. And you'll find that in some bars, they'll put their glasses in the refrigerator or even the freezer. But I'm always a bit worried about my glasses. And my freezer is small. I haven't really got the space. It's not putting glasses in there. But that's what you've got to do is chill that right down. And then the next thing is we're going to now start with stirring. Now, there is a very good reason why we stir a martini and we don't shake it. Number one is, as I said earlier, you get flecks of ice, which makes the drink cloudy. But the other thing is you will get much more dilution and we don't want to dilute it too much. So most professionals will stir under no account do you, um, as I say, you would not normally shake. Unless you're making the best for martini from the James Bond film, which I'm going to talk about the week after next. Now then, the first thing I do before I actually make the cocktail, I think about what I'm going to do with the garnish at the end. Now we are going to be using fruit. Um, we're going to use for this cocktail a lemon, but not the lemon juice, the zest. Now what I do is I take this peel, you've got to do this very gently because you don't want lots of pith on it. The pith is very bitter and not a nice bitterness. And then what we do, you probably can't see me, I'll show you in a moment. We just cut the edge off, make a neat slice. And that's all ready for the finish of the drink. Because when we've made the drink, what we don't want to do is find that it's getting more of my dilute because we're fiddling about with the zest. So do that first, get it out of the way. It's all ready to go. Um, we don't need that because we're not going to be shaking. We're going to be stirring. Now, the next thing we need to do is we use our measure. And I would use, for this evening, I'll use the Tanqueray. Very classic. We'll talk about other gins uh, in future weeks. But Tanqueray is my go to gin. And you'll find when you look at this glass, it's got ounces on one side and milliliters on the other. Americans tend to use ounces. So we pour that to 60 mil. That's a double, an American double, really. You could do 50, everything's in proportion. But for me, I like 60 mil. So that's the gin. Now, the vermouth could be anything from uh, 10 mil up to um, half, which is 30 mil. It's a matter of taste. The more vermouth you put in, the sweeter it becomes. I'm going to use 20 milliliters. Sorry, 10 milliliters, I think, which is a dry martini. It's pretty dry. Winston Churchill was asked, 
uh, buy a new steward in his club, uh, how dry he wanted his martini. And he said, well, you see that bottle of vermouth, Barman? He said, if you hold that up to the sun and you see the light shine into my glass, that's the amount of vermouth I want. Because he really liked his gin knee. Um, I don't like a lot of vermouth, um, but there is a trend now with very high quality vermouths and gins for some people to do the 50-50 again, certainly in the States, which tends to be a leader. So we've got in there ice, which in a bar world, you'd have chilled down with ice first and thrown it away, but um, operating on less ice. And I find this is, is pretty good for me. And you put the plastering in and you, I'm going to hold this up so you can see, I would normally do that on the bar top and go around and you can feel on the outside of the glass when it's really cold and start frosting. And you might do this for 20 turns, some people do, you might do it for a minute. A lot depends on the amount of ice you've got in there and uh, also how thick your glass is and the volume and so on. There are lots of factors. But you will know when it's really cold because this drink should be cold, cold, cold. So I can feel that's coming very nicely now. I don't know whether you can see that's crossing up. I can feel it's cold. The next thing you do is you get rid of the ice in the glass. Now, as I say, that will have had water in it, which will fill it down even more. But if you have a look at that, you'll see it's already frosting. Now, what I do now, I don't need to use the fine strainer because I haven't shaken it. And there are no bits in it. I'm pouring this out. I've got a bit of a shaky hand. Forgive me, but I think you can see you have a frosting on the glass, which is very important. Now, the next bit is very important. When you twist this, you get tiny little droplets which fall in there. You can't see them, but if I took a lighter or a match to this, they would actually flare up. So there are some little bits that have gone into the glass. And then, I don't know whether you can see this, we just put a little bit around the outside of the glass, like that, so we'll get the aroma. Um, we'll drop that in. Sometimes we use a cocktail stick and put it on the edge. But anyway, that is a martini and that's stirred, not shaken. And that's a beautiful drink. Now, for dry martini, you can use virtually any gin because it is the gin. Vermouth, again, there are many different kinds of vermouth, but that is a classic martini. That's to my taste. You may say that's too dry, I want it sweeter. Just find how much vermouth you want. So when you go into a bar, you can tell them. I just finally say that's the classic martini. There are lots of variants and martini has lots of different names. So that if you put a cocktail onion in, it becomes a Gibson. If you put a bit of olive brine in, the, the, the juice that your olives come in, make sure it's good quality um, brand. When you put the juice in, just a little bit, it goes dirty, it goes cloudy. That's called a dirty martini. I quite like that. It's got a very nice um, olive salty taste, but it's a matter of choice. Don't ever overdo the olive because you'll ruin the drink. So it becomes a matter of choice. And very often the number of olives you put in again will change the drink. For some reason with a martini, they never use two. They either use one or they use three. It's just an old bar tradition. Well, I think I'm finished, Paul. Um, I've talked about things I want to talk about. I don't know how we're doing for time, Paul. Um, I'm going to sit down and uh, maybe we've got some questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. Very enjoyable. I've always seen myself as, a, as James Bond. Uh, maybe maybe I've, I've got the hair for it now. Um, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, so you obviously really know, really know your stuff. Lots of people have been asking questions. So I've got a couple of questions for you, Martin. Yeah. Cheers. Oh, if you could raise that, if you could, uh, one minute, if you could raise it again, one minute, let's have a look. Do it again. There we go. Wonderful. Less like to spill it if I drink something. <laughs> so Martin, we've... Like, like a big glass. I mean, I like this because 
it, sometimes with a cocktail, if you're not careful, you've got too much cocktail for your size of glass, and that's a waste. Yeah. So that's that's a great glass. We've got a we've got a question here from Sarah, um, which I think I asked you the other day, uh, Martin. What's your favourite tipple? <laughs> that is a very hard question to answer. Um, I was asked that question by a friend only today. I think it, the answer is it depends. It's the same when I'm asked what my favourite wine is. Because my taste is so broad, a lot of it depends on um, the, the circumstances. If you're talking about cocktail, what I've been doing during lockdown is I've actually been making a different cocktail each day and they're all on my uh, Facebook page, on Tasty Martin page. And my go-to cocktail always was, and I still love it, it's called the Negroni. We're going to make a Negroni um, in a, a few weeks' time. A Negroni is three things. It's the easiest cocktail in the world to make, but it's easy to make it badly. All you have to do, it's a third gin, a third Campari, and a third of vermouth, red vermouth. Now, if you choose good gin, the Campari is always the standard, but the vermouth can change quite a lot. And if you use the wrong gin, if, for example, you use Bombay Sapphire, the Campari will kill it because Campari is very strong. So the important thing is to get all the ingredients in balance. And it's so easy. And then just add a bit of orange zest or a slice of orange and you're away. And that's so quick and easy. So when I'm tired and I don't want to mess about with all this, I do the whole thing in the glass, put plenty of ice in, preferably big cubes of ice, which melt more slowly, and I'll happily sip that. So that's probably, um, you know, my favourite go-to cocktail, particularly when I don't want to um, spend any time on it. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. We've also got a question here from, um, from Teresa. Uh, will Martin be making some non-alcoholic drinks? Because at the moment um, she's on medication, so I guess a few people are. Um, I guess you share lots of them on your Facebook page as well, don't you? Well, not really. I mean, I like my alcohol. I not in in quantity, I stress, but in quality. Um, what I can do is I can introduce some non-alcoholic drinks um, in the future. I hadn't planned to do it quite this early because we're going through the evolution of classic cocktails, um, and I would say these. Uh, what some people call mocktails, non-alcoholic cocktails, are becoming more and more fashionable, but they fall very much into the modern category. So I wasn't going to talk about them yet, but I'll have a little think about that and see whether I can bring um, one or two in sooner rather than later. Excellent. We've got another question here, Martin, from uh, Rosemary. It says, Martin, uh, do you have Arak in your drinks cabinet? Arak. Yes, I do. Um, but this is a fascinating question because Arak means different things depending on which country you're in. If you're in North Africa, um, many of those uh, countries, you have um, an Arak which is based, uh, it's very aniseedy drink, uh, a bit similar to Ouzo, that's Arak. Um, if you're in Sri Lanka, it's very different. You have a drink which is based on coconut, which is made from Arak, which I adore. And I could, I'm could i actually going to introduce a session on Sri, Sri Lankan Arak at a later date. But the important thing to remember is all Arak means really is the local spirit. So the Arak that's in India will be different to Sri Lanka, will be different to the Middle East. Not that in the Middle East you're drinking alcohol anyway, but in those Arab countries where alcohol is permitted, it will tend to be aniseed based. But um, yes, I, I love all these drinks. Excellent. That's a great question. Uh, and Martin, um, Claire, uh, Martin, would you choose fresh fruit juices over syrups to create cocktails? She's uh, she asked as she set as a set of syrups, which I don't really know what to do with. That is a brilliant question, Claire. And it's one which is much discussed in the trade. Personally, if you can, I don't think you can beat fresh fruit. But you've got to remember, you've got to go out and buy that because if you haven't bought the lemon, you haven't got it in the house. So it's very much dependent on, on constantly buying fresh fruit. 
Syrups don't last forever. I use a lot of syrups in my cocktails. Um, I've got some behind me. Um, I wasn't going to talk about syrups yet because they tend to come in with more elaborate cocktails. But yes, I've got some amazing syrups behind me. Um, if you've got non-alcoholic syrups, they will go off very, very quickly. It's a bit like buying fresh uh, juice in the supermarket, you know, a week to 10 days maximum, if, if that long, and it's gone off. Some syrups, um, particularly if there's some alcohol in there, will last longer, maybe up to about two or three months, but they don't keep forever. And the problem I have is longevity. I live on my own. I only use a little bit of these additional ingredients at a time. I don't like very sweet drinks and diabetic anyway, so I watch my sugar levels like a hawk. The problem is keeping them for long enough to use the bottle. Um, but I have got some amazing syrups behind me, which I can tell you about now or at future date if you want to know. But I don't know whether that answers the question. Um, the most important thing is don't open the bottle till you intend to use it. Same with cocktail cherries, they will go off. I'm not talking about the ones that are sickly sweet and synthetic, I'm talking about the proper maraschino cherries from Italy um, and in some other European countries, they don't last forever. I was looking at some cherries in liqueur in Marks and Spencer's today in Kish, um, and they look wonderful. And it said used within seven days. I was absolutely amazed. I thought the spirit would have kept them for a lot longer. But you know, it can be misleading. That's my only caveat if you've got them, use them or lose them. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, well, there's some really good questions there. And obviously, there's lots of people that got many questions about how to make cocktails and different drinks. So please, uh, please like Martin's Facebook page uh, at Martin's Drinks Club and ask some questions there. And of course, we can bring them into the further future shows as we go on. So Martin, this is a, the first one to introduce people into the kind of kit they need at home. So, so next time we're going to, I guess, dive more straight into the cocktail making and of course, welcome more questions. Yes, the plan is, this is progressive. So we made today a very simple cocktail with just two ingredients, which is a classic. I mean, every heard the martini. So next week, uh, instead of the martini, I'm going to use vodka, but no other difference. Now, it's not going to be a flavoured vodka, it's just a straight vodka. I find it less interesting, but you might love it. And I will talk about the difference between gin and vodka, because what people don't realise is they all come from the same still. And then you decide what you want to do with the distillate. You can either make gin or you can make vodka. And then you can flavour the vodkas. So gin is really only a flavoured vodka, very special kind of flavoured vodka. But nevertheless, that's what it is. So we'll see what happens when we use vodka. And then in week three, I will make the Vespa Martini, which is the one from the film Casino Royale, where we mix gin and vodka and we add an ingredient which we can't get the exact vermouth that James Bond described. He talked about a particular version of Lille vermouth, which has in fact uh, quinine in it. So I will be using um, an alternative which people are trying to emulate the cocktail I use today, but more about that in three weeks time. But we will try and replicate the same cocktail that was asked for in Casino Royale. Excellent, Martin. One of the things that one of the things that you and I were talking about was obviously looking to plan ahead. If people wanted to place a food, uh, a drinks order that they could then make the cocktails with you, um, the Facebook page, I guess, would elaborate a little bit more on the, maybe the, what they would need to buy. Well, what I've done um, for the next twelve weeks is I've stated the cocktail that I plan. Now, what I may well do is supplement it with a non-alcoholic cocktail because. Once we've got past this week, which had a lot of stuff in it, we're not going to repeat every week about the basics. People who've missed this week can always go back and look at this one if they want. What I'm going to be doing is telling you the cocktail that's coming next week. I could, in fact, give you the whole schedule of the drinks that I planned for 12 weeks. And then I can give you places to buy the ingredients. Now, some of the ingredients 
you will get in the supermarket. But increasingly with cocktails, because we're using things that not everybody wants, the cocktails, particularly in the supermarkets around this part of the world, are sadly lacking. We haven't got a shop that I'm aware of, an independent, that sells a big range of spirits. You'll find shops that sell some wonderful whiskies, for example, um, in um, the old quarter in Taunton, in St. James. Uh, there's a, the, the tobacconist there is a good friend of mine. He's got some wonderful whiskies that come from Scotland. It's probably got the odd gin or two, but the sorts of things that I'm talking about, you won't find in the shop. So I will give you the mail order companies. There are two big ones that the trade use and now sell to the public. Uh, one is Master of Malt, and the other one is the Whiskey Exchange, and those are my go-to companies. You have to buy £100 with the stock, but when you're talking about spirits, that's only four or five bottles, so it's not as horrendous as it sounds. And uh, again, with the kit, I will give you the name of a company that I know sells very good value cocktail kit, designed for the consumer at all price ranges, but there are others out there as well. And if anybody's got particular sources, let me know. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. We'll share that on the page. I've um, got a last question I think we'll end on uh, from uh, Mr. Clive Smith. Uh, is it a legal requirement in pubs to have measured spirits in a cocktail or do they just need to list the ingredients, Martin? Well, that's an extremely good question. The answer is no. Um, as I explained at the beginning, the difference between a mixed drink and a cocktail is very significant in this area. If you're talking about gin and tonic, yes, it has to be a measure. In England, 25 mil or 50 mil. In Scotland or Ireland, you get what they call gentlemen's measures. They tend to use larger measures, but they're defined. As soon as you've got three ingredients in a drink and you call it a cocktail, and water or ice or fruit juice is one of those, three liquids, that then becomes a cocktail and nothing needs to be measured not even the alcohol content. So it's got to be measured if it's a gin and tonic. It does not have to be measured if it's a martini. And, that, and some bars actually, in my view, the reason they get their um, ingredients, they use very cheap ingredients and they, get, they keep the retail price down, but you're not getting a lot of alcohol in your drink and you're getting cheap alcohol at that. If you want a really good cocktail, unless you go to a top cocktail bar, in my view, you're better off to make them at home. I hope that answers the question, Clive. Excellent. I'm sure it did, Martin. We've already learned loads uh, about cocktails already. I'm just going to end up there. I say thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. A great uh, first show, Martin. Uh, great. To, it's great to have this live on after all the months that we've been discussing it back and forward. And thanks again to Lizzie and Joe for for the kit this evening. I think we need to give Martin a round of applause. So we look forward, so this time uh, next week, Martin, we'll be working on the next cocktail, um, say details on them. It will be a vodka martini. So okay. we'll be doing much the same as we did this evening, but I just want to show you how you can change one ingredient to produce a completely different cocktail. And we'll be doing lots of this as time goes on. So in the end, you can make your own decisions. You can say, I don't like this, but I do like that. Now then you've got to ask yourself, would it just go together easily? Or maybe I've got to make a different cocktail. So it'll help you to make your own decisions. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. We'll catch you very soon. Thank okay, we're just going to end up there. Um, please like um, Martin's Facebook page. Please like uh, his page to keep up to date. And if you've got any questions for Martin, please um, send him your comments there or save them for next week's show. Hope you've had a good evening. And um, we'll be talking more about Taunton Food Bank, hopefully sending some money their way uh, if you'd like to contribute and enjoy the show. So have uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll hopefully see you very soon. Goodbye. Good evening and welcome to Martin's Drinks Club.